So tell me what's going on for you and how could I help? Well, I've been studying for the LSAT probably for about two months, but then in December, I studied for a month, stopped for a bit because of school, knowing I was going to take it this summer, and then started again once school finished in early April, doing probably about 25 hours worth of studying a week. But I find that the hardest thing for me is reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Logic games, I've improved a lot. Logical reasoning, I still definitely, I'm getting probably about like 19 out of 25, sometimes 17, 18, somewhere around then um, there. But reading comp, I can only ever get to three, which I've listened to your podcast. So I know you say to like kind of zero in on the three that you know will most benefit you that you can do the best and you could probably get the best scores in but I just want to improve well I wouldn't always recommend that approach it depends on your goals I actually think that doing only three passages puts a ceiling on how high you can ultimately score because you're guessing randomly on about seven questions so that advice would be for a very specific group of people Right. But let me ask you this, Brooke. What, what's your reading comp approach like right now in terms of note-taking, highlighting, underline? What do you do after you read a passage or as you read it? So I find for me, as I read it, I just kind of scribble on a sheet beside it because obviously it's online just because I don't even refer to the notes, but I find that it helps me um, understand more of what I'm reading. Um, I try to, if I don't understand a word, I'll circle it. Um, Just because sometimes I know that LSAT has a tendency to the trickier words, it tends to ask you about it later on or add it in somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I'll always kind of be aware of what I don't know. But I think the thing that gets me is I don't actively read enough. Like I don't think, okay, is this the example? Is this the author's opinion? Like, I think I passively read too much and I'm just kind of struggling. I'm trying so hard to understand it that I don't even understand what each component is doing for the passage as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you trying to really understand every single word, every single sentence? And how long does it take you to read initially? I'm going to say like, well, maybe like six minutes, seven minutes. Do you have extra time on the exam? No. Oh, oh yeah. No, no. I have to end up like, by the time I get to the last passage, I'm just clicking random answers just Mm -hmm. to get something in. And what's your goal score? My goal score is probably a 165. I would say I'd be happy with. Mm-hmm. Okay. And how do you do on the other sections? The other sections I do pretty good. Logic games, I think the lowest I'll get is maybe 19 out of 23. Mostly I'll get like 20, 22. Logic games I'm pretty good at. Um, logical reasoning, I find by the second section, my brain is just so burnt out that I can't even focus. And I'm just missing like parts that I normally wouldn't miss. And I'm skipping over parts I wouldn't normally skip over. I always do worse on the second logical reasoning section. Mm -hmm. Okay. The reason I'm asking is that I'm wondering if doing only three passages, as you said, would be feasible for you or Mm -hmm. if you need to do all four in order to reach your goals. So I would do some calculations there to see how many exactly are you getting on average on games, the other logical reasonings, to see what you can afford to sacrifice on reading comp in order to get overall potentially higher accuracy. Smart, okay, I see what you're saying. I think for me, the biggest thing is just, yeah, between logical reasoning and reading comp, I mean, logic games, I did, I did prep test 70 this morning. So I did a practice test earlier today and I found that like the logic games, I think it had like maybe two grouping games and the grouping games for some reason, normally I could do it, but it was just so, I know I'm kind of going all over the place here, but it's just, I guess I'm overwhelmed, but it's like, it was difficult. Yeah, I hear you. When are you taking the LSAT? uh, July 13th. If okay. it is that day. If it is. And it might, might be pushed back. And it might be a flex. So That would be, I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that possibility in mind that it might be a week or two later as it was for the June LSAT. They pushed it a week back, made it online. That might happen for July as well. So I'd be ready for the flex. I think that's actually majority likelihood as we speak now towards the end of May. But to bring it back to your initial question on reading comp specifically, you said you're trying to read every understand fully every single word, every single sentence, which is obviously good to do, but we also have to make sure that you're walking away with the key main points. 
the author's opinion, the primary purpose of the passage, the main idea. If you can walk away with that and nothing else, and you could scrap the details, that might be better off for you to help you knock out the big questions. You're right. I think I don't pay enough enough attention to the author's tone. And it's kind of difficult for me sometimes because I'm so caught up in understanding the main point to find those little key words that indicate what the author is truly thinking. Yeah. And you've got some time. You've got at least a month and a half, if not more, for the July LSAT. So as an exercise over the next week, I would suggest you do at least four passages untimed and just ask yourself, can you pull out the main idea and nothing else and knock out those questions? Then do the same thing timed. Mm, smart, good approach. Yeah, I'm going to try that for sure. I think another thing that just psychs me out is the fact that like you always want to make sure you're doing enough. And I think with any kind of standardized test, it's a really big, like it could be a really big disadvantage for a lot of people, including myself, that I feel like I'm never doing enough. But then I don't want to burn myself out. And it's just... You know how it is, I'm sure. Of course, of course. And what about, what about getting questions wrong? How do you feel around the idea of getting questions wrong? I try not to focus too much on it. Like I always, always try to see where I got it wrong. And I know, especially from listening to you and hearing what you say, that the review process is like one of the most important concepts of studying for the LSAT in general. But sometimes, you know, you have like a big ego and you don't want to know what you did wrong and you don't want to have to go back to it. And it's like, I think a lot of the time it's either has to do with me rushing and then I just kind of feel disappointed. So, I mean, I do focus on what I got wrong, but especially when it comes to reading comp, I try not to look at it. Yeah. Okay. So this is something really important here. There's also like, there's two things here. There's potentially doing too much and running the risk of burnout and then failing to review in favor of just doing more problems. Exactly. That's like exactly like, like it's like a devil and an angel on your shoulder is exactly what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. So what if it were okay to get questions wrong as part of the learning process and then every question you got wrong were an opportunity to learn something new? How would that change your prep approach? That would definitely probably make me more aware going into each question, my weaknesses and where I need to kind of focus on more. But I think I have a problem just identifying identifying what exactly I'm doing wrong. Because it's not like for me, it's a specific question type, more so as it is either I'm reading something wrong or I'm skimming over it wrong or I'm misinterpreting the language that LSAC is using because sometimes you have no idea what a word they're using means so you can interpret it in two different ways. Yeah and there's a there's a few things you can do about this because you're absolutely right about the kinds of things that make questions difficult the kinds of things that can trip you up. Step one is writing it out or talking it out to yourself but not just doing it all in your head not being done with it in five seconds and saying oh I get it now. It's actually slowing down and articulating it as part of your, your review process, as, you, as you've heard me say on the podcast and elsewhere. That's one step. The next step would be talking it out with a, a friend or a coach or a tutor. And then another thing would be looking up explanations online, looking up written explanations or video explanations. I've got plenty of video explanations out there as well as written ones available for the vast majority of prep tests. And so those could be a resource for you as well. Mm -hmm. But try, to, try so, to figure it out on your own first and in dialogue with others first, because that's personalized rather than one size yeah. fits all written or video. So then another issue would be how, do you, how much time should you spend on review? A lot, a lot. <laughs> so this is hard to commit because it's not fun to do. As you said, Looking over in detail every mistake you made and why and why you made it doesn't always make you feel great, but it's actually really important. And it's better you make those mistakes now rather than later and that you learn from them now rather than later. So I would say as you are, what are your other obligations between now and test day? Because that'll dictate how much time you should spend. I'm just taking one course, but I made it so it's an easy course. Like I can dedicate upwards of 30 hours a week towards the LSAT. Fantastic. And that's where you could run into the risk of doing too much. Yeah. So I feel like some days I'm just so exhausted that I just, I'd rather have 
more product I guess better productive days and not wear myself out but then when I'm doing too much in one day I feel like I'm over exhausted but then I'm like how do I know I did enough and it's just <laughs> well I'll, I'll give you a very simple rule for this it's <laughs> Steve's practice test rule it's min maximum three exams per week minimum three hours reviewing each exam so max three prep tests per week minimum three hours reviewing each exam. So would you say to review each exam on a different day than you took it? Probably yes, depending on how much time you take for it. It depends. If you're doing also a five section exam versus a three section exam for flex, that would change how much time it took you that day. If you're doing a five section exam, mm -hmm. you might not need to do anything else at all that day and you could review the following day. But for a three section That's flex, maybe you could do at least part of the review the same day. So what's kind of nerve nerve wracking about the flex too, is that I have no, I know they're still scoring it on the same system, but it kind of like reading comp would be the most, the section that's worth the most, would it not at this point? Technically, yes. Yeah. So I guess they're just kind of scaling it to how, to how it was like scaled before. So the flex, scale is still on the 120 to 180 range and those scores are equated they're said to be the same as the regular LSAT although obviously as you noted the weighting of different sections is slightly different rather than logical reasoning be, being about half it's approximately one third on the flex but for you personally since you noted reading comp as an area of difficulty you're definitely going to devote want to devote a lot of time to studying for that over the next several weeks because there's a good chance you'll be doing the flex Right. Okay. I see. So then how do you know how much you can afford to get wrong in order to get your desired score? We actually don't know exactly. We don't know exactly. <laughs> LSAC has not released any information on this and we can make rough approximations for what the raw scores would convert to on flex. And I, I get why you would want to know that sort of thing. I, I desperately want to know as well, but LSAC has not released anything on this. Ultimately though, each question is worth the same and you want to get the highest score possible. And that does not change from regular to flex. All that changes from regular to flex is number of sections you're doing and three section flex, you're done in two hours. That's probably a more pleasant test day experience than going somewhere in person for five sections. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I agree with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I know reading comp is the hardest section to improve on. And I know a lot of people say to read like the economist and stuff like that. Would you say to devote more of your time to just reading passages on, on your free time, even if you're just reading it over without answering questions or to focus on like newspaper articles? When you've got a month and a half till your LSAT, you do actual passages. If you had a year plus and you, you have downtime on your commute and you could be reading something versus you're scrolling through something on your phone, like you're probably better off reading a physical copy of The Economist or Scientific American than going on social media on your phone during a commute. But right. with a month and a half till the LSAT and you're home anyway, you're better off doing actual passages. Okay. Okay. So right now I'm taking two timed prep tests a week and then one untimed prep test a week. Would you say to just make all three timed at this point? Well, my question would be when you're doing an untimed exam, why are you doing it untimed and what are you looking to get out of that? I'm looking to see if I'm making, if I'm making, if I'm doing better than I am doing untimed to see if my untimed results or, or things I get wrong on the untimed part is just because I'm not putting enough um, time and focus into each question, specifically reading comp and logical reasoning because logic, logic games, I have no problem doing it under the 35 minutes but I want, I know that I rush a lot of the time. So it's just kind of for me to reinforce within myself that I do know what I'm doing, but I'm rushing too much when it comes to the time. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. But test day is approaching. You are going to be taking the exam under mm -hmm. timed conditions. I would say after you've built your foundation in the last several weeks, focus on timed and work on your pacing and endurance. Then later, do, when you're reviewing, you can look at things untimed, but we do have to get you ready for game day. You're right. Okay. Good point. I agree with you. I love that rule of thumb with the, with the um, reviewing for three hours. I, I probably reviewed for like maybe an hour at most.
I hear you. No, that's what a lot of students do. Some people will review for 30 minutes, but if you got 15 questions wrong and you had another trouble with another 10 that you weren't sure of, 25 problems, you're barely, it's barely a minute or two per question. Reviewing it, which is actually not that long. Right. So would you say after, after you do each exam to retry each sec section untimed and see what you still get wrong or just go into it knowing what you got wrong? There's value in redoing it untimed to give yourself another chance to work through the problem without knowing what the answer is yet, simply knowing that you got it wrong and nothing else. But you also have a time constraint there. It could take you a really long time to do that for every single section, every single exam. So I would say, don't do that all the time. Use it. It's one tool in your toolbox, but I wouldn't feel the obligation to do it every single time. Interesting. Okay. Wow. You gave me a lot to work with. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, we're about up for today, but before, before we sign off, what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? I would say the biggest insight I got was the review process. Fantastic. I think that's something that a lot of people, including myself, skip over just out of egotistical reasons or the fact that may be anxiety, but it is really important. Glad I was able to help. Anything else you would need to feel complete for today? No, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. My pleasure. Keep in touch and let me know if you need anything at all as you move forward. I will. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.